dragon of Ice Spire Peak. Running the Adventure This book is written for the Dungeon Master. It contains a complete Dungeons and Dragons adventure, as well as descriptions for every creature that appears in the adventure. It also teaches you how to run a D&D game. The other book that accompanies this one, called The Rulebook, contains information the players need to create and advance their characters, the adventurers and heroes of the story, as well as the rules you need to adjudicate situations that arise during the adventure. Overview A Dungeons & Dragons adventure is a collection of locations, quests and challenges that inspire you to tell a story. The outcome of that story is determined by the actions and decisions of the adventurers, and of course, the luck of the dice. You can run Dragon of Ice Spire Peak for as few as one player, or as many as five players. Each player starts with a first level character. The adventure is set a short distance from the city of Neverwinter, in the Sword Coast region of the Forgotten Realm setting. The Sword Coast is part of the North, a vast realm of free settlements surrounded by lawless, untamed wilderness. You don't need to be a Forgotten Realms expert to run the adventure, as everything you need to know about the setting is contained in this book. Role of the Dungeon Master The Dungeon Master, also called the DM, has a special role in the Dungeons & Dragons game. The DM is a referee. When it's not clear what ought to happen next, the DM decides how to apply the rules and keep the story going. The DM is a storyteller. The DM sets the pace of the story and presents the various challenges and encounters that the players must overcome. The DM is the player's interface to the D&D world, as well as the one who reads and sometimes also writes the adventure and describes what happens in response to the character's actions. The DM is a role player. The DM plays the monster and villains in the adventure, choosing their actions and rolling dice for their attacks. The DM also plays the part of all other characters who the adventurers meet, including the helpful ones. The most important thing to remember about being a good DM is that the rules are a tool to help you and the players have fun. The rules aren't in charge. You're the DM. You're in charge of the game. Choosing a Dungeon Master Who should be the DM for your gaming group? Whoever wants to be. The person who has the most drive to pull a group together and start up a game often ends up being the DM by default, but that doesn't have to be the case. DM Tips As the DM, you are the final authority when it comes to rule questions or disputes during the game. Here are some guidelines to help you arbitrate issues as they arise. When in doubt, make it up. It's better to keep the game moving than to get bogged down in the rules. Embrace the shared story. Dungeons and Dragons is about telling a story as a group, so let the players contribute to the outcome through the words and deeds of their characters. If some players are reluctant to speak up, remember to ask them what their characters are doing. It's not a competition. The DM isn't competing against the player characters. Your job is to referee the rules, run monsters, and keep the story moving. Be consistent and fair. If you decide that a rule works a certain way, make sure it works that way the next time it comes into play. Treat all rules and your players in a fair, impartial manner. Modify the adventure to suit your tastes. The adventure has no prescribed outcome. You can alter any encounter to make it more interesting and fun for your particular group of players. Keep a notepad and some graph paper handy. Use the notepad to keep track of details such as the character's marching order. Graph paper will be helpful if you need to draw a quick map for your players. Improvising ability checks. The adventure often tells you what ability checks characters might try in a certain situation and the difficulty class, or DC, of those checks. Sometimes characters try things the adventure can't possibly anticipate. You decide whether their attempts are successful. Ability checks only come into play if there's a genuine chance of succeeding or failing at the task. 
If it seems like anyone should have an easy time doing it, don't ask for an ability check. Just tell the player what happens. Conversely, if there's no way anyone could accomplish the task, just tell the player it doesn't work. If and when you decide that an ability check is required, ask yourself these questions. What kind of ability check? Use the descriptions of the ability scores and their associated skills in the rulebook to help you decide what kind of ability check to use. How hard is it? Decide whether a task difficulty is easy, moderate, or hard, and use the appropriate DC. DC 10, easy. An easy task requires a minimal level of competence or a modicum of luck to accomplish. DC 15, moderate. A moderate task requires a high level of competence to accomplish. A character with natural aptitude and specialized training can accomplish a moderate task more often than not. DC 20, hard. Hard tasks include things beyond the capabilities of most people without aid or some exceptional ability. Even with aptitude and training, a character needs some amount of luck or a lot of specialized training to pull off a hard task. Other components. The box containing this adventure includes components designed to help you as the dungeon master. In addition to the rulebook, these components are as follows. The DM screen. The inside of the folding screen has information that can help you while running the adventure. You can also use the screen to hide your notes and die rolls, thus keeping the players in suspense. Poster map. When you're ready to begin the adventure, unfold the poster map so that the map of Phandalin faces up. Here is where the adventure begins. When it comes time for players to embark on quests, Use the Sword Coast map on the reverse side to help chart their overland journey. Cards. The box contains the following cards. Combat step-by-step -step cards. These identical cards outline the order of combat as described in the rulebook. Condition cards. These cards describe various conditions that can affect creatures in the game. A player whose character is suffering from a condition can keep the card as a reminder giving it back to you when the condition ends for that character. Initiative Cards After the characters and each group of monsters involved in a combat roll initiative, distribute these cards among the combat participants, from highest to lowest initiative count. For example, whoever rolls the highest initiative gets the one card and acts first. Whoever rolls the second highest initiative gets the two card, and so on. Keep the numbered cards for the creatures you're running. Magic Charm Card This card describes a special charm, as for example, Charm of the Storm. You become charged with the power of the storm, to the extent that tiny sparks crackle in your eyes. You can cast the Lightning Bolt spell, a third level version, as an action. Once used three times, the charm vanishes from you. Give the card to the player whose character receives the charm. Collect the card when the charm ends for that character. Magic Item Cards When the characters acquire a magic item and identify it, give the players the card for that item. Let the player whose character has the item keep the card for reference until the item is expended or no longer in that character's possession. Quest Cards when a new quest becomes available to the characters, give that quest card to the players. Collect the cards if the characters complete the quest or they decide they don't want to complete it. Sidekick Cards If you're running the game for a single player, give the player these cards and let them choose a sidekick. The sidekick's corresponding stat block can be found in the rulebook. If the sidekick dies, collect the card the player can't choose that sidekick again. Adventure Maps Maps that appear in this book are for the DM's eyes only. A map not only shows an adventure location in its entirety, but also shows secret doors, hidden traps, and other elements the players aren't meant to see, hence the need for secrecy. When the characters arrive at a location marked on a map, you can either rely on verbal descriptions to give them a clear mental picture of the location, 
or you can draw what they see on a piece of graph paper, copying what's on your map while omitting details as appropriate. It's not important that your hand-drawn map perfectly match what's on the printed adventure. Focus on getting the shape and dimensions correct, and leave the rest to the player's imaginations. The Forgotten Realms The world of the Forgotten Realms is one of high fantasy, populated by elves, dwarves, halflings, humans, and other folk. In the realms, knights dare the crypts of the fallen dwarf kings of Delzoan, seeking glory and treasure. Rogues prowl the dark alleyways of teeming cities such as Neverwinter and Boulder's Gate. Clerics in the service of gods wield mace and spell, questing against the terrifying powers that threaten the land. Wizards plunder the ruins of the fallen Netherese Empire, delving into secrets too dark for the light of day. Bards sing of kings, queens, heroes, and tyrants who died long ago. On the roads and rivers of the realms travel minstrels and peddlers, merchants and guards, soldiers and sailors. Steel-hearted adventurers from backcountry farmsteads and sleepy villages follow tales of strange, glorious, faraway places. Good maps and clear trails can take an even inexperienced youth with dreams of glory far across the world, but these paths are never safe. Fell magic and deadly monsters are the perils one faces when travelling in the realms. Even farms and freeholds within a day's walk of a city can fall prey to monsters, and no place is safe from the sudden wrath of a dragon. Map of the Sword Coast The map below shows a region of forgotten realms called the Sword Coast. This is a place of adventure where daring souls delve into ancient strongholds and explore the ruins of long-lost kingdoms. Amid a lawless wilderness of jagged snow-capped peaks, alpine forests, bitter winds, and roaming monsters, the coast holds such great bastions of civilization as the city of Neverwinter, in the shadow of the fuming volcano, known as Mount Hotternow. This map is for the DM's eyes only, as it indicates the locations of places described later in the adventure. A larger, player-friendly version of the map appears on one side of the poster map included with this adventure. The poster map of the Sword Coast can be shared freely with the players as their characters explore the region. Geographical locations marked on both the DM's map and the player's map are described here in alphabetical order. This information is not secret and can be shared with the players if they request details about a particular location. Conaberry The Tribal Trail runs right through this abandoned town, which was sacked by barbarians years ago and now lies in ruins. A dirt road extending south of the town leads to a supposedly abandoned shrine dedicated to Savras, god of divination and fate. Crags These rocky windswept hills are dotted with old mines that have become infested with monsters. High Road This highway hugs the coast connecting Neverwinter to the coastal cities of Luskin to the north and Waterdeep to the south. For years the stretch of road south of Neverwinter fell into disuse because of frequent monster attacks. Of late, efforts have been made to keep the road safe, with light patrols of guards on horseback moving between Neverwinter and Lelon. Crypt Garden Forest This ancient forest tucked behind the Sword Mountains contains the ruins of bygone dwarven civilizations. Lelon This small town along the high road is in the midst of rebuilding itself after being abandoned for years. Its inhabitants hail from Neverwinter and are in the paid service of the city's Lord Protector, who has tasked them with turning Leland into a fortified settlement that can ward off threats from the Mere of Dead Men. Mere of Dead Men Travellers on the high road, which skirts the Mere to the east, must resist being lured into this cold and desolate swamp by bobbing will-o'-wisps. Countless adventurers have perished in the Mere, drawn by tales of ruined castles half sunk in the mire. Neverwinter 
This city was badly damaged when Mount Hotenau erupted some 50 years ago. Now the city of skilled hands works to rebuild under the watchful eye of its Lord Protector, De Gaulle Neverember, who rules in the absence of an heir to Neverwinter's crown. At present, no legitimate heirs to the old Alagonda royal line are known to exist, and many believe that the line is ended. Lord Neverember, taking no chances, quietly pays off or disposes of anyone claiming a connection to the rulers of old. Neverwinter Wood The forest east of Neverwinter seems to have a magical quality about it, or at least an air of mystical secrecy. Reclusive spellcasters are rumoured to dwell deep within. Fandolin This nondescript mining settlement, nestled in the foothills of the Sword Mountains, serves as a starting location for the adventure. Star Metal Hills This range of rocky knolls is so named because the area has been the impact site of a number of meteor showers over millennia. The hills are haunted by ruthless barbarian tribes, giving others little reason to visit the area. Sword Mountains These steep, craggy, snow-capped mountains are home to scattered tribes of orcs as well as other monsters. Ice Spire Peak is the tallest among them. Their foothills are strewn with the ruins of bygone kingdoms and more than a few half-forgotten dungeons and tombs. Tribor Trail This path south of Neverwinter Wood is the safest route between Neverwinter and the town of Tribor, located in the Deserin Valley to the east off the map. The trail is not patrolled, and monster attacks are commonplace. First Session Character Creation Dungeons & Dragons is a game that requires several hours to play, but you can stop the game at any time and continue it later. The first session should focus on character creation, one of the most fun aspects of the game. If the players create and equip their characters with time to spare, you can begin the adventure once they're ready to go. Otherwise, congratulate them on building their characters and begin the adventure with the next session. During character creation, your role as Dungeon Master is to let your players build the characters they want and to help them come up with explanations for how their characters came together to form an adventuring party. If you have only one player, work with that player to come up with their character's backstory. Then let the player decide if they want the character to have a sidekick. Character Options Each player has options when it comes to choosing a character race class, and background. These options are summarized in the character options table. If there are multiple players in the group, encourage them to choose different classes so that the party has a range of abilities. It's less important that the party include multiple races or backgrounds, as sometimes it's fun to play an all-dwarf party or a troop of adventuring entertainers. Character options. Races. Dwarf. Elf. Halfling, Human Classes Bard, Cleric, Fighter, Rogue, Wizard Backgrounds Acolyte, Criminal, Entertainer, Sage, Soldier While your players follow the steps of character creation as outlined in the rulebook, pay attention to the choices they make. The backgrounds they choose define who their characters were before becoming adventurers and also include role-playing hooks in the form of ideals, bonds, and flaws, things you as a DM want to know. For example, if a player chooses a criminal background, one of the options for the character's bonds is, I'm trying to pay off an old debt I owe to a generous benefactor. If that's the character's bond, work with the player to decide who that generous benefactor is. Running for multiple players if you have two or more players, the easiest way to start the adventure is to assume that the characters know each other and have some sort of history together, however brief that history might be. The characters might have met in Neverwinter and travelled to Fandolin together, or they might have arrived in Fandolin separately and gotten to know each other while staying at the local inn. Questions to ask Here are some questions you can ask the players as they create characters. 
Are any of the characters related to each other? What keeps the characters together as a party? What does each character like most about every other member of the adventuring party? Running for one player. If you're running this adventure for a single player, you can give that player a sidekick as a secondary character. Let the player choose one of the pre-generated sidekicks from the selection of sidekick cards. Rules and stat blocks for sidekicks appear in the rulebook. You might need to help the player run the sidekick for the first few sessions. If a sidekick is lost or no longer needed, the character can return to Phandalin and acquire a new one. Using Sidekicks Make sure the player understands the roles and limitations of a sidekick in this adventure. Sidekicks are stalwart companions who can perform tasks both in and out of combat, including things such as setting up camp and carrying gear. Ideally, a sidekick's abilities should complement those of the main character. For example, a spellcaster makes a good sidekick for a fighter or a rogue. Reading ahead. As the players familiarize themselves with the character options and adventuring gear described in the rulebook, take advantage of the opportunity to read ahead. The Adventure Begins section tells you everything you need to know about what's happening in and around Phandalin. It also describes quests that characters can pursue, leading them to other locations. The adventure is built around these quests. Hopefully, the characters will find them tempting enough to undertake. Glossary The adventure uses terms that might be unfamiliar to you. A few of these terms are described here. For descriptions on rule-specific terms, see the rulebook. Characters This term refers to adventurers run by the players. They are the protagonists in any D&D adventure. A group of characters or adventurers is called a party. Non-player characters or NPCs. This term refers to characters run by the DM. How an NPC behaves is dictated by the adventure and by the DM. Box text. Box text. At various places, the adventure presents a descriptive text that's meant to be read or paraphrased aloud to the players. This read aloud text is offset in boxes. Box text is most commonly used to describe locations or present bits of scripted dialogue. Stat block. Any monster or NPC that is likely to be involved in combat requires game statistics so that the DM can run it effectively. These statistics are presented in a format called a stat block. You'll find the stat blocks needed for this adventure in the Creatures section. Ten Day In the Forgotten Realms, a week is ten days long and called a ten day. Each month consists of three ten days, thirty days in total. The Adventure Begins The adventure begins in the mining town of Phandalin. There, the characters receive quests and can choose which ones to pursue. The Adventure Background section describes the events leading up to the adventure and the main threats the characters will face. The Welcome to Phandalin and Exploring Phandalin sections describe the town where the adventure begins. Knowing Phandalin well will ensure a smooth start. Adventure Background Driven from lands farther north by more powerful dragons, a young white dragon named Cryovane has descended upon the Sword Mountains, claiming the snow-capped range as its domain. Typical of its kind, Cryovane is dim-witted and cruel. The dragon patrols the skies around Ice Spire Peak, surveying its territory while hunting for food and easy treasure. With each passing day, the dragon's domain grows as it ranges farther across the land preying on anything it can catch with its claws, or freeze to death with its icy breath. Sightings of the dragon are becoming more common, as are its attacks. A crumbling fortress on the northeast spur of Ice Spire Peak serves as the dragon's lair. Cryovane sees the icy fortress from a tribe of savage orcs, killing the orc war chief and forcing the tribe's survivors to flee into the foothills and forests. Enraged by the death of their war chief, the orcs have called upon ancient allies, evil shape-changing half-orc spellcasters, who bless and advise them. These half-orcs worship Talos, an evil god of storms, 
and many dwell in the dark depths of Neverwinter Wood. In stormy weather, they gather on remote hilltops to summon Gorthok the Thunderbore, a primal entity that serves Talos. Like the god it serves, Gorthok delights in destruction. The orcs aren't the only creatures thrown into an upheaval by Cryovane's sudden arrival. A manticore driven from its mountaintop nest by the roaming white dragon has migrated to the foothills and begun terrorizing folk living on the outskirts of the mining town of Phandalin. Other monsters in the region have been similarly displaced. Welcome to Phandalin. The frontier town of Phandalin is built on the ruins of a much older settlement. Hundreds of years ago, the old Phandalin was a thriving human town whose people were firmly allied with neighboring dwarves and gnomes. Then an orc horde swept through the area and laid waste to the settlement, and Phandalin was abandoned for centuries. In the last three or four years, settlers from the city of Neverwinter and Waterdeep have begun the hard work of reclaiming the ruins of Phandalin. The new settlement is home now to farmers, woodcutters, fur traders, and prospectors, drawn by stories of gold and platinum in the foothills of the Sword Mountains. The arrival of a white dragon threatens to destroy all their work to rebuild. When you are ready for the adventure to get underway, show the poster map of Phandalin to the players and read aloud the following. Nestled in the rocky foothills of the snow-capped Sword Mountains is the mining town of Phandalin, which consists of 40 or 50 simple log buildings. Crumbling stone ruins surround the newer houses and shops, showing how this must have been a much larger town in centuries past. Phandalin's residents are quiet, hard-working folk who come from distant cities to eke out a life amid the harsh wilderness. They are farmers, stonecutters, blacksmiths, traders, prospects, and children. The town has no walls and no garrison, but most of the adults keep weapons within easy reach in case the need for arms should arise. Visitors are welcome here, particularly if they have coin to spend or news to share. The Stonehill Inn at the center of town offers modest lodging and meals. A couple of doors down from the inn, posted outside the town master's hall, is a job board for adventurers. When the adventurers are ready to inspect the job board, proceed to the town master's hall section. Exploring Phandalin The characters might wish to explore key establishments within Phandalin. These locations are marked on the map of Phandalin and the corresponding poster map. Stonehill Inn this modest two-story roadhouse has six rooms for rent on the upper floor. A bed for the night costs five silver pieces, while a meal costs one silver piece. The proprietor is a short, friendly male human named Toblin Stonehill. Toblin is a native of the town of Tribor to the east. He came to Phandalin to prospect, but soon realized that he knew a lot more about running an inn than he did about mining. If the characters talk to Toblin, he shares a brief tale told to him by one of his regular patrons. Roll a six-sided die and consult the Phandalin Tales table to determine which tale Toblin knows, or pick a tale the characters haven't heard yet. Barthen's Provisions The shelves of this general store stock most ordinary goods and supplies, including backpacks, bedrolls, rope, and rations. Barthens doesn't stock weapons or armor, but characters can purchase other adventuring gear here, with the exception of items that cost more than 25 gold pieces, as described in the rulebook. Characters in need of weapons or armor are directed to the Lion Shield coaster. Those looking to buy potions of healing are urged to visit Adabra Gwyn at Umbridge Hill, as described in the Potions of Healing sidebar. The proprietor, Elmer Barthen is a lean and balding human man of 50 years. He employs a couple of young clerks, Andler and Thistle, who help load and unload wagons, and who wait on customers when Barthen isn't around. Characters who engage Barthen, Andler, or Thistle in friendly conversation are told a tale. Roll a d6 and consult the Phandalin Tales table, or pick a tale the characters haven't heard yet. 
Lion Shield Coaster. Hanging above the front door of this modest trading post is a sign shaped like a wooden shield with a blue lion painted on it. This building is owned by the Lion Shields, a merchant company based in the city of Yatar, over a hundred miles to the east. The company ships finished goods to Fandolin and other small settlements throughout the region. The master of the Fandolin post is a sharp-tongued human woman of 35 named Lenine Greywind. Lenine keeps a supply of armor and weapons, all of which are for sale to interested buyers. Prices are listed in the rulebook. Lenine won't sell weapons to anyone she thinks might be a threat to the town. If the characters talk to her, she recalls a tale told to her by one of her neighbors. Roll a d6 and consult the Fandolin Tales table, or pick a tale the characters haven't heard yet. Fandolin's Minor Exchange Miners come here to have their valuable finds weighed, measured, and paid out. The exchange also serves as an unofficial records office, registering claims to various streams and excavations around the area. Enough wealth is hidden in the nearby streams and valleys to support a good number of independent prospectors. The exchange is a great place to meet people who spend a lot of time out and about in the countryside surrounding Fandolin. The guildmaster is a calculating human woman named Halia Thornton. She is also an agent of the Zentarum, a shadowy organization that seeks to exert secret control over the North through wealth and influence. Halia is working slowly to bring Fandolin under her control, and she can become a valuable patron to the adventurers who don't cross her. If the characters get on her good side, Halia tells them a tale. Roll a d6 and consult the Fandolin Tales table, or pick a tale the characters haven't heard yet. Shrine of Luck Fandolin's only temple is a shrine made of stones taken from the nearby ruins. It is dedicated to Tamora, goddess of luck and good fortune, and is normally in care of a zealous elf acolyte named Sister Garali. However, she is out of town for the duration of this adventure. Sister Garali is a member of the Harpers, a scattered network of adventurers and spies who advocate equality and covertly oppose the abuse of power. The Harpers gather information throughout the land to thwart tyrants. They aid the weak, the poor, and the oppressed. Sister Garali regularly reports to her superiors on events in and around Fandolin, and is currently in Neverwinter doing exactly that. In her absence, the shrine is left unattended. Fandolin Tales Roll a d6. On a result of one, the tale is, Once again, the orcs have come down from the mountains to prey on the lowlands. If Neverwinter doesn't send help soon, the orcs will overrun Fandolin and destroy everything we've worked so hard to rebuild. On a result of two, the tale is, As the Tribor Trail runs east, it passes through the ruins of Conaberry, a town sacked by barbarians years ago. There's a ruined temple south of Conaberry where it's said that the locals hid their gold. If the characters visit this temple, see the Shrine of Savras. On a result of three, the tale is, Strange magic pervades Neverwinter Wood, confounding navigators and obscuring the ancient ruins of bygone kingdoms lost in its depths. On a result of four, the tale is, Falcon's Hunting Lodge is the only safe haven in Neverwinter Wood. It lies deep in the forest along a river's edge, and wealthy nobles venture there to hunt while under the Falcon's protection. Falcon is a retired veteran of many wars, and it's said he'll offer free room and board to anyone who brings him a bottle of wine. If the characters pay Falcon a visit, see Falcon's Hunting Lodge. On a result of five, the tale is, West of Fandolin, on the coast, is an old stone lighthouse. Ships are drawn to this gleaming tower like moths to a flame, and are doomed to crash on its rocks. Their wrecks must be filled with treasure. If characters visit the lighthouse, see the Tower of Storms. On a result of six, the tale is, Some folk claim to have seen a dragon flying through the high clouds. 
At that distance, it's hard to gauge the creature's size, but some say it's as big as an elephant and has gleaming white scales. Town Master's Hall The Town Master's Hall has sturdy stone walls, a pitched wooden roof, and a bell tower at the back. The job board next to the front door features a sparse number of notices, all written in common and in the same hand. If the characters inspect the notices on the job board, proceed to the Fandolin's Quest section. Potions of Healing No place in Fandolin sells potions of healing. However, characters who wish to purchase one or more such potions can do so at Umbridge Hill Windmill, located a few miles south of Fandolin. The windmill is home to a midwife and an acolyte of Chontia, goddess of agriculture, named Adabra Gwyn. For more information on this location, see Umbridge Hill. Fandolin Quests The job board outside the Town Master's Hall is where adventurers can learn about quests. Each quest is printed on a card, which you can give to the players when that quest becomes available as described later on in starting quests and follow-up quests. Let the players choose which quest to complete first, second, third, and so on. If the players don't like a particular quest, they are under no obligation to complete it. However, completing quests help the characters become more powerful, as described in Leveling Up. Harbin Wester, Quest Giver All the notices on the job board are written by Harbin Wester, Vandalin's duly appointed town master. Harbin is a pompous middle-aged banker who lives in a house east of the town master's hall. Reports of a white dragon in the area have turned him into a venerable shut-in. He rarely goes outside except to get food and to post new notices calling for adventurers. Characters who knock on Harbin's door hear his voice on the other side say, if you're a dragon, know that I'm far too thin and bony to make a good meal. No matter what the adventurers do to allay his fears, Harbin refuses to open the door, preferring to talk through it. Other residents who trouble Harbin with complaints receive similar treatment. If the characters ask him about a quest, Harbin sets them on the right track, offering payment upon their return. When the time comes to pay up, he slips the payment under the door one gold coin at a time. Adventure Locations and Encounters This adventure encourages characters to explore locations marked on the DM's map of the Sword Coast. When the characters embark on a journey to a location, flip to the section of this book that describes the location in detail. For example, if the players choose to undertake the Umbridge Hill quest, go to the Umbridge Hill section. Each location includes an overview that briefly describes what the characters can expect to find there. This overview is followed by information you'll need to run the encounters at that location. Running Encounters This adventure describes what the characters can see when they first arrive at a location and what they'll discover as they explore it. The adventure also tells you how the location's inhabitants react to the character's arrival. No encounter has a predetermined outcome. For example, characters who explore Umbridge Hill are likely to encounter a manticore. Although fighting the monster is always an option, characters might decide to negotiate with the manticore instead. Be flexible, particularly when dealing with intelligent monsters. If every encounter becomes a fight to the death, your players might get bored and miss out on some fun role-playing opportunities. Wherever possible, Reward players for being clever. For example, characters who disturb the ancakes at the loggers' camp might be able to escape from the burrowing monsters by jumping in the nearby river. Similarly, characters who are willing to negotiate with the were-rats in Mountain's Toe Gold Mine might be able to forge a truce between the were-rats and the miners, ending their conflict so that the mine can be reopened. Starting Quests when the characters first visit the job board, there are three quests posted. Give the players the cards for these quests so that they can choose which to pursue. Dwarven Excavation Quest Dwarf prospectors found an ancient dwarven ruin in the mountains southeast of here and have been working on an archaeological dig, seeking treasures and relics. 
They need to be warned that a white dragon has moved into the area. Take the warning to them, then return to Town Master Harbin Wester to collect a reward of 50 gold pieces. If the characters undertake this quest, see the Dwarven Excavation. Gnomengard Quest A clan of reclusive rock gnomes reside in a small network of caves in the mountains to the southeast. The gnomes of Gnomengard are known for their magical inventions, and they might have something with which to defeat the dragon. Get whatever you can from them. If you bring back something useful, and don't want to keep it for yourselves, Town Master Harbin Wester will pay you 50 gold pieces for it. If the characters undertake this quest, proceed with Nomengard. Umbridge Hill Quest The local midwife, an acolyte of Chontia, named Adabra Gwyn, lives by herself in a stone windmill on the side of a hill a few miles south of Phandalin. With dragon sightings becoming more common, it's not safe for her to be alone. Urge Adabra to return to Phandalin. Once she's safe, visit Town Master Harbin Wester to claim a reward of 25 gold pieces. If the characters undertake this quest, proceed with Umbridge Hill. Follow up quests. After the characters complete two starting quests, the following three quests are added to the job board. Butterskull Ranch Quest. Orcs have attacked Butterskull Ranch five miles east of Conaberry along the Tribal Trail. Travel there with haste, assess the damage, and help in any way you can. Ranch owner Alphonse Big Al Calazorn is a retired sheriff who can help you for your efforts. If he's dead, return to Town Master Harbin Wester with proof of Calazorn's demise to receive a reward of a hundred gold pieces. If the characters undertake this quest, Proceed with Butterskull Ranch. Logger's Camp Quest Deep in Neverwinter Wood, along the river that flows west towards Neverwinter, is a logging camp. Every two months, Fandolin delivers fresh supplies to the camp, which is run by the half-brother of Fandolin's townmaster, Harbin Wester. Barthen, the local provisioner, has prepared a new delivery. He needs someone to bear the supplies safely to the camp. Return to Harbin Wester with a notice of delivery signed by his half-brother, Tybor Wester, to claim your reward of a hundred gold pieces. If the characters undertake this quest, proceed with Logger's Camp. Mountain's Toe Quest The Mountain's Toe Gold Mine lies 15 miles northeast of Phandalin. The new overseer, Don Joe Raskin, just made the trip from Neverwinter to Phandalin and needs to be escorted to the mine. There's no telling what dangers lie between here and there. Once you deliver Raskin safe and sound, return to Town Master Harbin Wester to collect a reward of a hundred gold pieces. If the characters undertake this quest, proceed with Mountain's Toe Gold Mine. After the characters complete two follow-up quests, another three follow-up quests are added to the job board. Axholm Quest Within a mountain 15 miles south of Phandalin, stands the ancient dwarven fortress of Axholm, which has been sealed for years. If a dragon attack is imminent, the people of Fandlin might need to evacuate and take refuge in Axholm. To that end, someone needs to open the fortress and make it safe for habitation. Once you accomplish these tasks, return to Town Master Wester to collect a reward of 250 gold pieces. If the characters undertake this quest, Proceed with Axholm. Dragon Burrow Quest The dragon that besets us is not the first to threaten this region. Between here and Neverwinter lies the Barrow Mound of a warrior whose magical dragon-slaying sword helped fell a green dragon, terrorizing the High Road a century ago. Rumor has it the dragon slayer sword is buried there too. Retrieve it and let the sword be its own reward. If the characters undertake this quest, proceed with Dragon's Barrow. Woodlands Man's Quest The orcs have fallen under the sway of evil spellcasters in Neverwinter Wood and have been sighted in growing numbers near Falcon's Hunting Lodge. The spellcasters dwell in a ruined manse. Falcon needs someone to help make a preemptive strike against it. Destroy the evil in the manse, then expect him to reward you. 
If the characters undertake this quest, run Falcon's Hunting Lodge, followed by Woodland's Mance. Leveling up. Characters advance in level by completing quests using the guideline for leveling up in the rulebook. Regardless of the number of characters in the party, the rate of advancement is as follows. Characters gain a level each time they complete a starting quest, until they reach third level. Once they are third level or higher, completing a starting quest has no effect on their level. Characters gain a level each time they complete two follow-up quests. Characters gain a level if they slay Cryovane, the White Dragon. Where's the White Dragon? Cryovane, the young White Dragon, is a roaming threat and can be encountered almost anywhere. Each time the characters arrive at a location tagged on the map of the Sword Coast, or prepare to leave that location, roll a d20 and consult the dragon's location table to determine Cryovane's current whereabouts. Make your first roll on the table when the adventurers leave Phandalin for the first time. When the dragon visits a location that is not its lair, it surveys a location from the sky, beyond the reach of ranged weapon attacks. If it spots nothing it can eat, it flies off after circling the location for a minute or two. If it spots something tasty, such as a mule, a horse, or a character, the dragon swoops down and attacks it. Once the dragon kills something, it grabs the carcass and flies off with it. Whatever it takes is eaten within the hour. If Cryovane loses more than 10 hit points in a battle, the dragon disengages from combat and retreats to its lair at Ice Spire Hold, remaining there until it finishes a long rest and regains all its hit points. Only at Ice Spire Hold does the dragon fight to the death. Dragon's Location Table Roll a d20. On a result of 1, the dragon is at Axholm. On a result of 2, it's at Butterskull Ranch. On a result of 3, it's at Coneyberry. On a result of 4, it's at Dragon Barrow. On a result of 5, it's at the Dwarven Excavation. On a result of 6, it's at Falcon's Hunting Lodge. On a result of 7, it's at Nomengard. On a result of 8, it's at the High Road. On a result of 9, it's at Ice Spire Hold. On a result of 10, it's at Lelong. On a result of 11, it's at the Logger's Camp. On a result of 12, it's at Mountain Toes Gold Mine. On a result of 13, it's at Neverwinter. On a result of 14, it's at Fandolin. On a result of 15, it's at the Shrine of Sarvras. On a result of 16, it's at the Star Metal Hills. On a result of 17, it's at the Tower of Storms. On a result of 18, it's on the Tribor Trail. On a result of 19, it's at Umbridge Hill. And at a result of 20, it's at the Woodlands Manse. 